How's it going everybody? Thanks for uh, checking out this video. Before we start, I do want to point out that this one is going to be a long one. Um, I actually took a long time to shoot and uh, edit and produce this video, so I really hope you guys enjoy it. Um, if you do, I would greatly appreciate a thumbs up, or if you didn't like it, thumbs down. That's okay too. Um, and of course, as always, subscribe. Uh, it just helps the channel grow, and uh, the feedback helps me bring you guys more stuff you want to see. So with all that being said, let's get into it. All right, time to get in the car, go for a little drive, blow off some steam. Only question is, which car to take? Should I do the 1M or the M2? Hmm. No, I think, I'll, uh, I think I'll start with the 1M. It's a good place to start. You know, the other thing is, the 1M cost about 60 grand these days, which is about the same price as the M2, brand new. Maybe it's a good question to ask. Which one of these cars should you buy for 60K? Um, considering I can drive them both back to back and compare them and contrast them, I think it's a good question for me to answer. So, let's make a video on that, and uh, hopefully by the end of this, we got ourselves an answer. Let's go. So, what does Matt Farah, Doug DeMiro, and Chris Harris all have in common? They all love the 2011 1M. And really, what's not to love? This car is basically the most fun sports car in the last 10 years that, I mean, you can get that's this raw. I mean, it, it just is. There's just so much to this car, which I appreciate every year I've owned it um, more and more. Now, one thing to point out is this car is 10 years old and I've owned it for seven. Now that might not seem like that big a deal, but I haven't owned any other car for that long. So that's really telling, not just to people who know me, but also to myself, how much this car really stands out in my mind as a keeper because there's so many things that make it special. I think one of the best things about this car really comes down to the, the steering itself. One of the last true hydraulic steering systems that there is. And it's weird, but you can definitely tell the difference when you go from this to an electronically steered car, which most cars these days are. The next thing is, this car is basically a baby E92 M3. And what I mean by that is, there's so many things that this car borrowed from that car in that same era. So the engineers who decided this is something that they want to build, they did it kind of under wraps on the side and on the weekends and didn't even bring in executive management to take a look at this until it was done because they wanted it to be perfect. How did they accomplish this? They went into the parts bin. They knew that engineering everything from scratch was going to cost too much, take too much time, yada, yada. But they still wanted a small, compact sports car that really embodied what BMW's ultimate driving machine um, motif really pointed to. And they felt they were losing a little bit of that. So they took a 1 Series, gave it far wider fender flares, and stuffed it with E92 goodness. And uh, the results? are awesome. This car handles so well. And you know what? It's a short wheelbase, but that doesn't make it a bad thing. That makes it more fun. <laughs> All right. 
right, that's fun. Uh, uh, come on, Raven. Whoa! Okay, I was not expecting that. <laughs> Damn, every time, dude. Okay. <laughs> Love this car. I, you just, mm, okay. Besides the steering, you have to talk about the power delivery of this car because it is unlike anything you've ever experienced because this car is closer to like a Group B racer than it is a modern turbocharged vehicle. It just, you know, there is a little bit of lag. You step on the throttle, there's a little bit of lag and as it builds, you feel this thrust all of a sudden push you into your seat and then you're off to the races. And that experience, you just don't find it today. Find me a car in 2020 that does that. You won't, you won't find it. Um, that's so cool about this car and it does surprise you each and every time. I have to also talk about the looks of the car. It's not for everybody, I will agree. Um, because, you know, the one series was not really looked at 10 years ago as, you know, the luxury car from BMW. It was just the entry level BMW, right? So I don't think a lot of people fell in love with it at first, but the people that drove it and realized it had great dynamics and the 135, really surprising performance, all of a sudden started really falling in love with the car's looks. Fast forward to the 1M's production, it just took all of that and really up to the ante tenfold, right? You got a wider body, you've got E92 goodness built in, and now the aggressive looks, which have been upped, match even more performance. And so there you go, now you've got a nice little package. But that being said, how do I feel about this car's looks 10 years later? Well, I think that it does look good still. I think the E46 M3, in my opinion, is probably one of the best looking BMWs and will age the best, especially 20 years from now. I think the 1M slightly behind that. And, you know, look, what, what kind of keeps it close? It's really, for me, the wide stance and the curvy body, those muscular hips. Those are the things that really make this car sexy to me. But the 46 M3 just has some perfect proportions, which even though it's not rare by any stretch of the imagination, because they made so many of them, it just looks good and it, I think it'll always look good to me. And that's why I've also owned two of them in my past and I really wish I kept my Laguna Seca blue one. But what can you do? So before we go any further, you know, I think it's great that we're talking in generalities, but I'd like you to get to know my 1M a little bit closer. So that being said, check this out.
All right, guys, so first things first, I have to apologize because I have not formally introduced my new 2020 BMW M2 competition to you guys yet, but I'm doing that in this video. So let's just talk about the lux of the M2 for a second because especially here in 2020, I think it's an important topic for BMW. Here's the thing, BMWs have always, in my opinion, had classic styling. Like, it is the perfect balance between, you know, a sportiness to it, an aggression, a luxury look, and yet nothing that's going to stand out to the point where it's too look at me, right? But the new giant grill thing, that trend that's been happening for the last couple of years is just getting out of hand. I think a lot of people would agree with that. But this car doesn't have that issue. Now, the front end has been changed over the OG M2 because the motor is different, right? The motor got changed versus the, uh, the original N55 to the S55 simply because of emissions. The BMW realized that they weren't gonna be able to economically get the N55 to meet all emission standards globally that were needed. So they just decided, well, we've already put all that development into the S55, let's do the swap. However, the S55 actually needs more airflow, hence the redesign in the front of this car. Not that the original M2 didn't look good from the front, I think it did, but I think this car now looks more aggressive and I, I find my eye likes the lines better. And now when I look at the older M2, I kind of feel like it looks more dated. I don't know if anybody else feels that way. If you do, put your uh, comment down below, I'd love to hear it. One of the things I also wanted to point out is this car has more weight, and so BMW has addressed that weight problem by adding bigger brakes all around. And we're talking really massive brakes. As a matter of fact, 15 inch rotors in the front with six pot calipers, right? And uh, look, that's great. Thank you, BMW, for doing that. And on the street, they really do give you all the power you need. They, they don't ever make you feel like you can't stop in time, no matter how fast you're going, no matter what situation. I think these brakes are amazing. But I wonder on the racetrack, I wonder if it's gonna be a similar story or if they'll let you down after a few laps. My suspicion is they'll probably get soft, and I'm really hoping I'm wrong on that, but the only way I can really tell is to take this thing on the track, which I do plan to do, and we will definitely put some videos out on that coming soon. If you're a drive enthusiast, I think you'll appreciate what I'm about to say, which is, you know, part of the experience of driving, what makes it fun, is that, yes, you can feel the car handle. That's huge. You can experience the G-forces, right? You can, um, you know, get excited when the car's like in lockstep with how you feel it should be behaving. I mean, those are, those are just attributes of a fun drive. But the one thing that's missing is sound. When you've got the car singing to you, right? The exhaust notes are just throaty, that, that, that burbleness, it's like right there. And you can tell what the engine's doing alongside of your shifts and as you roll into the throttle and experiencing all the G-forces and, and all that stuff at the same time. That's what, for me, completes the driving experience. And you know, this car is just geared to be a little bit more civilized. And so though it sounds, I think, pretty good from the outside, from the driver's seat, which is the most important place to hear it, it's pretty muted. And that's a little disappointing. Um, I, I, I know I can change that um, in the aftermarket. And uh, I do plan on putting a, a fun little exhaust system, which I'll do a video on later on. But I just wish that I didn't have to go that route, right? It would have been an, it would have been nice to have a sports car that took sound more seriously from the factory. And if you don't think sound is that important, try watching any horror flick, for example, and right at those most intense moments, just hit the mute button. And I bet you anything, you will not find that whatever scene to be nearly as intense and as scary um, and you know it, it just pulls you out of that moment 
I think that same logic applies to driving. The better the sound, the more it contributes to an amazing experience. Thank you engineers at BMW M for at least giving us something, but my ask would be in future cars to really not be afraid to turn it up. Porsche doesn't fear it, and you know I think they've done a great job because all their cars sound great, but GT4 is my favorite sounding Porsche at the moment, and uh, you know just take a ride in that and you'll understand what you're missing. You know, this wouldn't be a evaluation of a car if I didn't talk about the way it handled. Um, you know, it's so strange. This car has such strange suspension from the factory because, and I'll explain here in a second. When you're just putting around town, I mean, the car actually feels a little stiff and it almost feels like they didn't put a lot of thought into how the car is gonna behave and it's just cheap suspension that they threw on. Um, you know, this is not adaptive like in the M2 CS or anything like that. They're just regular, you know, McPherson struts and shocks and, you know, a, kind of a stiff spring rate. But <laughs> when you drive it a little bit faster and you throw it into any corner, and I don't mean aggressively, I just mean you turn in, right? All of a sudden, everything just kind of makes sense on this car. It's really cool. Like. I'll go through this corner here. The car is leaning just a tad, but it feels like it squats a little bit and then you can get on the gas super early and you're just flying out of the corner at a really decent speed. I mean, it works. I don't know if there was that much of a binary decision when they were designing the suspension system where they're like, do we do something that's for, you know, going fast or do we do something that's for living on the daily? I don't know if they thought that way, but it feels like this car was not necessarily tuned up the Nürburgring, which I think is a good thing. And they thought about if you're buying this car, it must be somebody who likes driving fast and they're going to appreciate the engineering at those speeds, at those scenarios where you're carving corners. That's where your money's gone. That's where the 60 grand for a car like this ends up. It's when the chassis, the wheel choice, the staggered tires, rims, um, the you know the the M differential, all those things, including the suspension, all line up to give you your sixty thousand dollar driving experience. And uh, right now, I am not disappointed. One feature of the M2, which a lot of cars have these days, is the auto blipping, and you know, the 1M doesn't have any of that. Um, it's a lot more primitive. And when I started driving this car at first, I, I really didn't like it because my natural tendency was to roll my right foot onto that accelerator pedal and flip the throttle. I just do it automatically without thinking. And when I first started driving this, because it was already doing that, I would just add to the revs and it sounded weird and it was totally missing the the, the RPM alignment, so I had to stop. That kind of annoyed me, if I'm being honest. But now that I've driven the car in some um, really fun roads and pushed it, I've actually kind of found it to be nice because there's definitely moments when I can tell that you know I'm harder on the brakes and it would have been more difficult for me to actually blip the throttle. So then in, that, in those cases, just being able to go from fourth into third and have it already rev match is kind of a luxury. And I hate to admit it, but I kind of like that. <laughs> of course, you can fix that if you want to. Uh, I think there's two ways of doing it. Somebody can correct me in the comments if, if I'm wrong, but for sure you can turn off, you know, all the safety systems, the traction control and all that. And at that point, you know, revving's on you no matter what happens. The second way, is I believe you can actually tune it out. But I could be wrong on that, although I have read online that there are ways to get it tuned so that way you, you don't have to, you know, you don't get any blip assistance, if you will. But, you know, look, at the end of the day, this car is designed to be for the person that is gonna drive it every day and, you know, probably is gonna do an you know, an occasional track day, but mostly this is going to be going through cities and towns and, 
maybe some countryside here and there, and that's about it. So for people like that, you know, it's, it's a nice feature. So, you know, thumbs up for me on that. So before you can make the decision, is the M2 really better than the 1M or vice versa, you gotta get to know them on a individual car basis. So let's get to know my M2 and understand a little bit more about it in terms of the details. So check this out. Sort of interesting, really. The M2 is a little bit of a misfit across the current BMW lineup. And I do mean that in a good way. There just isn't anything else from BMW's portfolio that's this driver focused. So how does this car compare to the 1M? And after 10 years of innovation, what about it is better? Well, I think there are some worthy things to discuss when looking at the M2. For example, the technology. Yep, the tech. As you know, even with sports cars, technology is just a part of our life, and so it's got to be integrated in. And usually I wouldn't care so much about that stuff, but when you live with the M2 over a period of time, you start to really appreciate it. From a safety perspective, you get stuff like lane drift awareness, forward car collision detection technology, and all that stuff's working in the background, and it really does help you feel a little bit more secure. But it's more than that. It's also about the luxury and the convenience. And yes, most people say they don't want these things when they're hardcore race car, track focused type drivers who buy sports cars, but when you live with something like this, you might feel differently. Examples of this would be the heating and steering wheel, the conforming seats, the Apple CarPlay and the touchscreen interface, and let's not forget the wireless phone charging ability and Wi-Fi hotspot. Clearly, none of these things are going to add to how fast a car is but they do add to the overall pleasure of owning the car and daily driving it. Therefore, if you're looking to buy a car like this, you have to consider that. As for the looks, though subjective, I think the M2 is really mean looking. I think it will age well, and I think it's one of the best looking cars you can buy from any car company today, especially at this price point. That being said, when you compare it to the 1M, the M2 is still a bit more conservative than the 1M was during its introduction. Not a bad thing, just different. In the handling department, I would say the M2 outperforms the 1M from a cornering speed perspective. The caveat is, it feels more detached than the more raw 1M, and thus a little bit less engaging. But it's still a hoot to push the car around and turn, look down at the tack, and see a ridiculous speed. On the topic of power, 
you can't really discuss that without really diving into the, the beast of a motor in that S55. It really is amazing that in its development, you can get so much horsepower over the 1M Zen 54 with the same displacement. But even more impressive than that are the torque figures. 406 foot-pounds to the 1M's 332 foot-pounds. As we all know, horsepower is great, but it's really the torque that makes you feel the speed. And there lies the beauty of the M2. It's deceptively fast, incredibly comfortable, and easy to live with. When you also consider that with some basic bolt-ons and tuning, the S55 can become an absolute animal of a performer, it's really nice to know that you can make this car anything you want it to be, even in the modern era. So, let me be clear. Both of these cars are great, period. They just are. But they are significantly different, and that's what's so interesting about this comparison. When we look at the 1M closer, it has obvious personality. On the road, it seduces you into thinking that it's faster than it actually is. I think that this is mostly due to its lightness at just over 3,400 pounds in conjunction with that gem of a motor in the N54 bi-turbo. Around corners, the chassis remains composed and the nose always stays tucked. I know my car has been modestly modded, and yes, I am running aftermarket coilovers, but I would argue that even in stock form, it felt extremely capable and willing to stay locked to the pavement. Very little compromise. Probably my favorite standout attribute though has to be that hydraulic steering system. I just had no idea how much I would miss it in modern cars because let's just be clear, it's that connectivity through the wheel to the road that gives us the confidence and keeps me encouraged that I can drive the car faster because I know exactly what those front tires are doing at all times. These little things really add up to so much. But I think that there's more going on here. Just under the skin of the 1M, this car, it just wants to be driven. And I know a lot of people say that about a lot of cars, but this really does. It, if I let this car sit for too long, it almost punishes me for a few drives until it goes, okay, now you're consistently driving me and now I'm happy. It just feels punchier the more I drive it. It feels more eager to go places. It wants to go on road trips. It behaves almost like it's alive, at least on some level. I mean, I guess I could say it feels like there's a soul in there. And ultimately, this car specifically has been through a lot of amazing experiences in my, in my lifetime here in the last seven years. And so I do have a personal attachment to the car as well. And I'm trying to keep that factor out of the equation so that anyone who's looking to spend that 60 grand can make an educated choice here. But I gotta tell you, I just don't think you can go wrong with the 1M. It's rarity, it's specialness, the way it rewards its driver, it's just over the top amazing. And that is all the reasons why I love the BMW 1M.